when you make a movie, depending on where you put the camera, the same scene can look differently, you know? How creative the director is, he can put the camera in different spots and make the same scene look differently. The reason I'm saying is that the, this passage I'm going to read today is probably one of the most <laughs> heard and read stories or movies <laughs> from the New Testament. But the guest speaker today is Dr. Cutter Calloway, is a professor of film and theology at Fuller Seminary, and I'm sure he is going to put the camera in a place that we haven't seen before. It is very difficult for me to introduce a friend. <laughs> Cutter is a friend, he's a colleague, um, I met Cutter because we were doing the same program at Fuller. He was a couple of years senior to me in the program, not by age, nowhere near. Um, uh, but he is an overachiever. Um, I'm going to put a slide up there, hopefully, with, uh, with all the books he has written. Um, all this, uh, you know, while there, is, uh, there are three kids running around the house, he has written so many books. And uh, not only that, he went on to do another PhD in psychology. So if I leave him alone, he will do another PhD, and it will destroy <laughs> the academics, you know, continuing that pursuit. So I wanted to give him a break and to come to the real world and talk to real people. And I asked Cutter <laughs> to come today, uh, particularly because he is also a man at the intersection of faith and science as much as he is in the intersection of faith and film. And so he coordinated many programs related to faith and science, and particularly at Fuller Seminary and beyond. And as you know, we are doing the Infinity Summit that is coming in two weeks. I reached out to Fuller uh, and uh, Cutter for their collaboration, and we are working together on this project and many other projects. So I'm going to read the scripture, and then I'm going to invite Cutter uh, to the stage. Uh, would you stand with me for the reading of the word? Luke chapter 10, verses 25, all the way to 37. And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your, mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers. And they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged him uh, bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave, him, gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands. And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. This is the word of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, Dr. Cutter Calloway. Yeah. Well, I was... Uh going to say thank you to Pastor Matthew for inviting me to speak uh, today. And then I've been here watching the worship service unfold, and it started with a children's choir, which was ridiculously cute. 
Uh, then moved to uh, baptism stories where one woman called Satan a punk angel. Uh, one of the believers being baptized then referenced her bunny with a broken foot, which was the cutest thing I've ever seen. And then we hear from Alexander talking about his ministry in Ukraine. So I think I need to rescind my thank you because this was a setup. Um, <laughs> I, uh, that is a tough act to follow, and uh, I'm not sure what, what you expect, but this is going to be the low point of the service, um, <laughs> definitely. So uh, <laughs> it is Mother's Day, and uh, given that it is Mother's Day, and also that when Pastor Matthew asked me to preach today, I did not know it was Mother's Day, um, I think in my own best interest, I should start with some commentary on how amazing the mother of my children is, uh, just so the rest of the day goes well for me. Um, <laughs> I, love, I love my wife for all sorts of reasons, um, but one of the things that I've always just been really amazed at with her is this kind of joy and delight she gets uh, when she reads to and with our children. Uh, not only, you know, actually reading for them before they could read, but then also as we gather together and hear now our uh, older children read to each other and we kind of tell stories. And uh, a while back when our kids were quite a bit younger, um, one of the books that we would most often read together comes from this uh, series, multi-volume series called Read Aloud Bible Stories, right? This is one of our go-to uh, 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 books that we would read because, you know, we're really good Christians. Um, and <laughs> that, was, that was a joke. Um, and, and we would often uh, open it up, and before, again, our kids could actually read themselves, um, my wife and I, we would sit down and we would read through the table of contents, which you might be able to see up here. Um, here's the table of contents for this one, volume two. You've got Simon in his boat, the boy who went away, the boy who shared his lunch, the man who helped, a sad day and a happy day. That's the Easter story, actually. So we'd go through the table of contents and we'd read uh, the table of contents and let them pick the story that they wanted to hear. My oldest daughter, uh, her favorite story was The Man Who Helped, otherwise known as The Good Samaritan. And as we'd read these stories to our children, um, they would love to kind of look at the illustrations, right? Now again, they're not readers yet, but they're hearing us narrate the story. They're watching the narrative unfold. And they're doing things like identifying different elements of the story that stand out to them, identifying with different characters. They'd say things like, oh, Daddy, why are they being so mean to him? Are those his owies on his arm and in his face? Look, Daddy, I have an owie on my arm, too, right here. And it wasn't long um, after we started this nighttime tradition of reading from it that um, my daughter would ask for her favorite story by name. And I remember this one time I sat down um, and opened this exact book here. And I said, okay, which one do you want to read? And I was about to read through the table of contents, but she beat me to the punch and said, oh, I know which one I want you to read, Dad. I want you to read The Hurt Man. I said, The Hurt Man? I was like, well, I think that, is that in a different volume? Or no, 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 that's, it's this one right here. You know, it's it, the, the pink letters. It's The Hurt Man. And I go, I, I don't think that that story's in here, sweetie. And I said, oh, do, do you mean the man who helped? No, Dad, I want you to read The Hurt Man. Now, my daughter, being a kid, being sort of shaped by narratives, right? We tell kids stories all the time. They tell stories all the time. She has this intuitive understanding of how stories work. And it didn't matter what Ella Linval, the author of this book, said to her. It didn't matter what she titled the story. It didn't matter what her dad, who, by the way, young girl, uh, has two PhDs and knows a thing or two about what the Bible says, right? It didn't matter what her dad said. This story was about the hurt man. And when I heard her say that, I sort of had this aha moment, right? Not only as a person of faith and as a father, sort of listening to his children, um, but also as a person that's really interested in how we as Christians, as we as the church, engage culture. Because it completely upended my understanding of Jesus' parable, the, the, the way I had been taught to imagine what this story was teaching us, right? It completely turned on its head the way that I understood the parable of, quote, the Good Samaritan, or what my daughter said was the hurt man. 
And in a couple of weeks, the Infinity Summit is coming up, and we are talking about in that, in that summit, and, and hopefully in years to come, um, what it means for us as people of faith, as Christians, both as individuals and as a community, to engage our culture in faithful and effective ways. And that, the topic here in a couple of weeks will be on science in particular, but the way that my daughter's insight into the story upended the story of the Good Samaritan for me, I think applies not only to science, but also to the arts, to religion, to politics, to socioeconomics, to any domain of culture we can imagine. It really informs and I think uh, uh, reflects what Jesus is inviting us to when we think about what does it mean for the church to engage culture. So just think about it. If you've got your Bibles, open those uh, back up to Luke 10. Um, Pastor Matthew read this for us. But, but think about our Luke 10 passage for a moment. And again, you've heard it so many times um, in so many different ways, from kids' books to the actual scripture to uh, retellings in film and media and elsewhere. But think about it for a moment. Who most often do we assume is the hero of the story, the protagonist? Who do we think and assume is the character that, that drives the action, the one we're supposed to identify with? It's the Samaritan, right? The good Samaritan. He's the hero of the story. He's the one who comes to the rescue, right? And, and, and he actually helps the man who's beaten on the side of the road in spite of what we all know are incredible amounts of religious and political and ethnic and racial taboos, right? In spite of those hurdles that were put in front of him, he condescends towards this man in his great desperate time of need and he helps and he is the one who we are called to identify with. It's obviously the character that we are supposed to emulate. It's why the, the title of the story, if you look in your Bible, is, I have this really fantastic Bible that I use. It's the Net Translation, if anyone's interested. It's a bunch of experts that had did an open source translation. Right here in the Bible, it says, the parable of the Good Samaritan. So I know that that's what the, the hero is, right? Um, it's why those who aren't even a part of the Christian community, maybe you have some friends who are, are not Christians, who aren't a, a part of church, and yet, what do we call do-gooders in most of Western society? We call them Good Samaritans. You may or may not know this, but many states in the United States have laws on the books called Good Samaritan laws, so that if you don't help someone who is obviously in need, if you pass by them on the other side of the road without helping, you can be held legally responsible for not helping them. So societally, we know all of the signs are pointing to the person we're supposed to identify with in this story is clearly the good Samaritan, the man who helped. It's all just that straightforward and simple, right? Except that it's not. It's not. The story actually begins not with a Samaritan. The story is only told in Luke 10. It's not in any of the uh, other gospel accounts. And the Good Samaritan, the title, isn't actually in the text. It's an editorial edition, right? You get your, your Bible split up into different sections. It's an editorial edition that's almost exactly like the title of the table of contents we have here saying, The Man Who Helped. I'm telling you, I'm framing, as Pastor Matthew said, I'm framing this story for you by inserting the Good Samaritan at the beginning. But that's actually not in, in the actual original texts. The story begins not with a Samaritan, but with a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now that parable is actually couched and framed by a prior conversation, right? And this is where Jesus is talking to a legal expert in Jewish law. It's a Jewish legal expert in Jewish religious law asking Jesus to interpret the Torah, the Jewish sacred text. After reciting one of the central prayers of the Jewish people at that time, the man then asks, who is my neighbor? And the text says, wanting to justify himself. Because Jesus says, oh, you've done this, right? You've, you've honored God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you've loved your neighbor as yourself. And then wanting to justify himself, the Jewish expert in Jewish legal theory asks the Jewish Jesus, who is my neighbor? That is, who am I called to love as I love myself? Now, this is a really important piece of the story because you've got to understand, when Jesus now starts his parable, the question he's actually responding to and the person, the individual who's asking the question. So Jesus replies to this 
Jewish legal expert with a story about a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, who is the kind of person that might start a journey that begins in Jerusalem and then goes to Jericho? A Jew, right? Uh, in this case, you know, Jesus is usually the answer. In this case, when Jesus is telling a story, a Jew is the answer. Um, always right. So, he's speaking to a Jewish audience, to a Jewish expert in religious law, and he tells a story about a Jewish man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. He, in other words, this Jewish man is the focus of the story. He begins the story. He brings the story to its completion. This Jewish man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho is the one who robbers come and beat up and accost and leave half dead on the side of the road. This Jewish man's body is the reason that the other religious leaders avoid him entirely by walking around each side of the road. And of course, as we know, it's this Jewish man who becomes the object of the Samaritan's great kindness. Now, after finishing the parable, after finishing the parable in which this Samaritan man comes and comes to the aid of the Jewish man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, Jesus then turns back to the expert in Jewish religious law, and he asks him to answer his own question. This is where it would be so frustrating to be a pal of Jesus. He never gives you a straight answer. He's like, I, ask, I answer a question with a question, you answer your own. But he comes back to him, and he, has, he asks the Jewish man to answer his own question. Which of these three became a neighbor to the Jewish man? The answer to the expert's question, who is my neighbor, that is, who am I to love out there, becomes clear. It's the Samaritan. The Samaritan is my neighbor. The Samaritan is the person I the beaten and broken man on the side of the road am called to love. Here's the point. I think if we take this story as a story and we think about my daughter's insight into this story as being about the hurt man, we see that Jesus' parable is actually calling its readers today, its hearers at the time, not to identify with the Samaritan, but as the man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. In other words, we're not the heroes of this story. We're the helpless victim. Which means that the neighbors we are called to love as ourselves are those who condescend toward us and not the other way around. The parable actually directly confronts the idea and the assumption that loving one's neighbor is something that can be done from a position of power and privilege and resources and self-importance. Being a neighbor is not about the ways in which the privilege put their various resources to use. It's about accepting one's fundamental weakness, frailty, and helplessness, allowing the religious, the political, the ethnic, the, relation, the, the, the racial other to help us in our desperate time of need. Now, if you read many of Jesus' parables, you'll see that they are all, always sort of uh, laying traps <laughs> for the hearers. You think it's going to go one way, and then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, whoa, we're in a different world than I realized, Jesus. And this parable is, is no different. And a, and a twist that I think is befitting of Jesus' parables it's only when we assume a posture of humility, when we allow the other who is culturally, politically, religiously impure to touch us, it's only when we do that that we are able to love both God and neighbor. Or to put it differently, before we can be a neighbor, we have to learn how to be neighbored. When it comes to in engaging culture, it's very tempting, I think, and very easy for us to assume uh, that we are in the position where we are above or superior to our surrounding culture, as if we are the heroes of God's dramatic work in the world, right? Do you ever find yourself kind of fantasizing <laughs> a kind of a hero or savior complex, right? Like, oh, everything God is doing really centers around me, the primary person in this story. I'm the hero, right? I'm the one that's called to help the poor and the marginalized. And I'll get to that in a second. We are called to do that. 
But it's interesting that here, when we think about engaging culture as a church, as individuals, we often think that we're the heroes of God's work in the world. Um, from this perspective, culture is in need of our help, of our resources, of our compassion. Where would culture be without us, right? We are the ones bringing the help and the salvation that is so much needed. But Jesus' parable offers us a much different vision. One that recognizes that more times than not, we are the ones who are helpless and in need. And that our culture might very well offer us something valuable in our time of desperation. Now, this might be uh, disconcerting to you. <laughs> um, you might go, Cutter, you probably shouldn't let your three-year-old child at the time give you the interpretive lens that you're reading the Bible through. She may be a, a, you know, an unreliable narrator. Maybe, maybe that's true. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that even if this sort of reading of like, oh, wow, this, this crazy loon from across the street at Fuller is telling us we're the beaten man on the side of the road, not the Good Samaritan, what does this mean? Um, before we worry about too much of how this might upend your picture of the story, I actually think it's not that scandalous at all. I, I think if, if you think about U.S. Christianity, the U.S. church, I'm not talking globally right now, just the church in the United States, I think this actually offers a better description of reality. I don't know if you all have been paying much attention, but the church doesn't have a whole lot of credibility right now in the United States. We are, in many ways, lying dead, half dead, beaten, bruised, and weakened on the side of the road. And we could really use some help. The one difference, I think, in the story is that most of our wounds are actually self-inflicted. <laughs> and that is a problem, right? But as we think about engaging culture, I, th I think as I sort of look at students coming through Fuller and serving in different churches, both here and around the world, what I realize especially that, that plagues U.S. Christianity is that we are so accustomed to playing the part of the hero, we can't even see how broken and bruised we are. So not only are we unable to accept that fact <laughs> and say, whoa, we really need some help. We really need some outside help because we don't have the resources, we don't have the wisdom, we don't have the capacity. But then when it comes to those who are actually there to offer us help, we reject it. Why? Because they don't speak for God. They don't know what God is up to in the world. They can't be reliable. And in fact, sometimes they are impure. They're ethically questionable. They're operating in some way that doesn't align with my understanding of who God is in the world. And so I would, I would accept help from some people, but I would never accept help from them. Now again, this is a very U.S. thing. Think about Eric's uh, story about our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. I taught uh, some pastors in Ukraine a number of years ago, and uh, it's, it's been incredibly disheartening to see. I was, I was in uh, Chernihiv. And many of you may now know of this town because of the recent uh, invasion by Russia. And I was always struck by the faithfulness of, of our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and hearing the story of them going, you know what? We need, what do you need? Everything. Have you ever heard an American Christian or an American church say that word or that phrase? I'm in desperate need. What do you need? I need everything. This is what it means to think differently about the Good Samaritan. What if we are not the heroes of the story, but we are being called to acknowledge our weakness and our frailty and that we have needs that we can't meet on our own? Now, you may be thinking, well, is this the only way to read the parable? <laughs> no. There are times, there are places when we do have the resources. And you flip the script immediately and you go, wow, Lake Avenue Church has been helping <laughs> uh, people in Ukraine in their time of need. So this is a story. The, the great thing about Jesus' parables is that they're thick, right? Um, it's a story so you can identify with different characters at different times. Sometimes we're those religious uh, representatives who pass on the other side of the road. Sometimes we are the Good Samaritan. But often, and I think what our invitation now is to see what does it mean for us to identify with the hurt man. So don't think this is the only way to read it, but it is one way. 
And another thing that, that might come to mind is, well, does that mean if we are in a time of need, if we do need help, that everything that's being offered to us is good or true or helpful? No, no. As we think about engaging culture, just because we're acknowledging that we have needs that can be met by others doesn't mean that everything that is offered to us we need to accept with open arms, right? Wisdom and discernment is always, always important and necessary. But I think before we can even take a first step toward understanding and engaging culture faithfully and effectively, we have to come to a place where loving our neighbor involves a basic and unqualified affirmation of their goodness, truth, and beauty. And this is not going to be easy or comfortable for those who are accustomed to being in a position of power, those who are accustomed to playing the part of the conquering hero. But for the hurt man, and this is key, for the hurt man, it is the only option, which really just adds to the risk that's involved, right? You think it might be risky to be a good Samaritan in overcoming certain political and religious and ethnic taboos. Imagine how risky it is to acknowledge you're vulnerable and to invite someone who may very well take advantage of you, who may very well not have your best interests in mind, and to say, I need your help. That's risky. But on a very basic level, our ability to engage culture with the gospel will come down to whether or not we are willing to embrace and move out into this world with that daring kind of humility. Just a question for you, what if, what if Christian cultural engagement started with our acknowledgement or maybe even our confession that we are just as broken and bruised and in need of others as anybody else? How might that change the way we understand our role in public life, our role in our offices, in our places of work, our role in our families, our role as creators of entertainment and other forms of culture? How might that change the way we consume or critique culture? How might it change the way we respond to and create culture ourselves? The hurt man. My daughter's right. That is a better name for the story. And it magnifies the weightiness of Jesus' final question when he says, who became a neighbor to the hurt man? It's the Samaritan. It's the culture, cultural and religious and political and racial other who most fully embodies the kingdom in this story, not the people of God. Which makes Jesus' final words as troubling as they are challenging. Go and do the same. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for a day in which we can celebrate so many things. Celebrate the way that you have shaped all of our hearts and minds and lives by mothers, by women that we can celebrate the public declaration of people of all ages taking a faithful step in obedience towards you. Where we can celebrate the global church and the way that we can meet real material needs of brothers and sisters who are encountering, enduring incredible moments of hardship and violence and trauma. And God, we thank you that you have given us the opportunity to think about, on a deep level, what it means for you to call us to be gospel people in and for the culture in which you've called us. I fully recognize <laughs> that I struggle with embracing the kind of humility that I think you're calling us to today. I would way rather be the hero than the victim. And yet it seems that at this moment, at this stage, in the year 2022, May 8th, in Southern California, in some way, shape, or form, you are inviting us to assume a different kind of posture, one that's not gonna be comfortable for most of us. And because of that, Lord, I ask that you give us strength 
You give us courage. You give us wisdom. As we think about what it means to be followers of you in a time that is marked so often by chaos and confusion and ongoing traumas, we thank you for the sign <laughs> of young children singing your praises. And we ask that you allow that to shape our vision moving forward.